right into our, our lesson. Last week, we looked at the fact that God is our creator. How many days did it take God to create everything in the world and the universe? Six. Six days. And what did he use to create it? The power of his, of his word. And when God got done, how was everything? Perfect. 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 And people, mankind, really the, the crown of God's creation, everything else really was created for the benefit of mankind. And remember, God gave special blessings to, to Adam and Eve, to mankind. What were those special blessings? Well, he told the animals to do that too. Oh. To take care of it. One was to rule over creation, to take care of it for God. And the other, I suppose, was. Well, there's really a couple more we could mention. One would be family and marriage, uh -huh. um, in the way that God brought Adam and Eve together. And Adam and Eve were created how? God's image. In God's image, what does that mean? Like, um, that he really chose how they, like, they were perfect. They had a perfect knowledge of God's will, a perfect relationship to God. Um, and so as they were going to rule over and take care of the world, they would do that, that perfectly as God wanted. Now when God got done creating, it wasn't that he was done with creation, that now he sat back and said, well, I hope everything goes right. But God continues to take care of us, doesn't he? He continues to, to provide for us every day and provide for, for all of his creation. And that's what we want to take a look at tonight, is how does God preserve us and take care of us? So turn to Psalm 36, verses 6 and 7. Verses, please. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O oh Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love, both high and low among them find, find refuge in the shadow of your wing. For one, it tells us what does God do for his creation, for all people. For all things. Preserve. He preserves. What's it mean if you preserve something? Like you something. save it. You, you keep it, it safe so that it doesn't spoil, huh? So God it. says preserves. And points to already, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but why does God do that? Look especially at the beginning of verse 7. Because of his love, yeah. Because of his love. And then it reminds us as well, who does he do that for? Who does he preserve and take care of? Us. Us and? Everyone. Everyone and? Everything. Really everything, doesn't he? So man and beast, huh? Not just, the, not just people, but animals as well. And I suppose it causes the plants to grow. And God takes care of all of that. Psalm 145, verses 14, or 15 and 16. Confirmation work because it kept bouncing around. Ethan. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are brought bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. 16, yes. You opened your hands and satisfy the desires of every living thing. So, again, who does God preserve? Everything. Everything. Again, every living thing looks to God uh, for what they need 
to live for, for life, and God provides that. Um, so we think of you know, what we usually think of as nature uh, and the natural cycle of things. Who's really seeing to it that those things continue and, and go on? God, God is. Um, it's not that, uh, it goes in the sense that, again, God put those in motion and then sat back and just lets them run on, on their own. But God's still working, and he works through those natural means usually to do that. But he's very much in control, isn't he? He's very much in charge there. First Peter 5, verse 7. What does Peter remind us about God? That he cares. That he cares for us. What's anxiety? Stress. Stress, Stress, worry. Anger. So do we need to worry about really anything? No. Why not? Because God's got it. God's got it, yeah. God cares for you, and if God cares for you, he's going to take care of you. He's going to provide. So we don't need to worry. It doesn't mean that we don't plan doesn't mean that we don't work, but we don't have to worry. Luke 12, verse promise does Jesus give us there? What's God going to do for us? Clothes. Let's see to it that we have, again, the, the clothing that we need. Who's looking out, and you maybe look out, who's in the spring of the year, and you have a beautiful field of flowers, all sorts of different colors. Uh, it can be pretty spectacular, huh? Uh, when you think of how those colors even kind of meld into one another, and even hard for you know the best artists to kind of duplicate that huh? because of, of its beauty. I think God does that. How important are you in comparison to those flowers that are going to dry up and die as the summer heat goes on? Yeah. Way more important, huh? And so that's Jesus' point, huh? If, if God's that concerned about these little things in in creation that maybe don't matter a whole lot in here, you know, well, what happens, you know, too, with the, even some of the, the fields. They get plowed down and you roll it up for hay so that the animals have something to eat, um, or it gets burned up. Um, you know, we don't think anything of those sort of things. But God's concerned about those, and if he's concerned about those things again, he's certainly going to be concerned about, about us and about people. Luke 11, verse 3. Tyler. Give us each day our daily bread. So we hear from the Lord's Prayer. And what does Jesus teach us to ask for? Daily our daily bread. bread. Our daily bread. Why does he teach us to ask for daily bread, do you suppose? Yeah. Well, why not ask for our yearly bread? Well, maybe then God would give us so much that we wouldn't have to pray to Him again the next day, huh? Because we'd have everything we had needed, huh? But that's kind of the point, isn't it? Every day God wants us to look to Him and, and trust in Him. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't store up so that we have some for the future, huh? It isn't that God, you know, provides for us 
on a daily basis, a lot of times he gives us a lot more than that, doesn't he? And I think of the, the Israelites in the, in the wilderness when they were traveling from Egypt to the promised land, their God did give them their bread every day. Huh? That manna appeared in the morning. They were to pick up only enough for that day. And if they kept more of it, then it spoiled by the next day. God was teaching them, I'm going to provide for you every day. You can, you can trust me. But God wants us to have that kind of trust in him and confidence. Huh? Oh, not that I look and say, well, I got a whole bunch of money stored up in the bank, so I'll be able to buy whatever I need for a long, long time. I don't need to worry about, about uh, what the Lord's going to do. Um, but he wants to, you know, yeah, that may be the case. But again, who allowed us to do that? Yeah. God. Yeah, would you have a question? Um, I have a comment. Okay. Someone um, said it's daily bread, not cake for special occasions. So. And that, too, that it's what we need, huh? Um, you know, certainly bread includes everything that we need for life when we pray that in the Lord's Prayer. But if we think of that, you know, that's kind of the, the most basic food, isn't it? Um, you know, so we aren't praying, God, give me a great big steak dinner and, you know, a fancy bottle of wine or something. You know, again, God may very well provide us with things of that nature that we can, can have more than just a, a very simple meal, that we can have something special. But God promises to provide. He promises to, to care for us. So... God provides all that I need to keep my, my body in life. I don't think you have a place for that. How does he provide then for the things that I need for this, this life? How does he go about doing that? Psalm 104, verse 14. What's that? No, there was no place for, for that one to read right down. That was really more the introduction to see that God promises to take care of us. Now we're going to look and see just how he does that and how well he does that and some of the special ways that he does that. Emma, verse 14 there. He makes the grass grow for the cattle and the plants for men to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. So how does God provide food for us, Jenner? What does he do? What does he cause to happen? Um, plants to grow. For stuff to grow. Huh? So the grass grows, the cows eat the, the grass, they grow, you're able to slaughter the, the cow and take care and grind up the meat and have yourself a hamburger. huh? Um, you know, or go out and you plant the seed in the garden and... Whatever plant that is, you know, your tomatoes grow or your carrots or whatever they might be, and now you can harvest those and eat them. Uh, yeah. Through that natural means, um, by causing you know, the seed to sprout and grow, the, the rain to come, the sun to shine, uh, God provides for us. Genesis 8, verse 22. Go ahead, Ethan. As long as the earth endures, seed time is hard as cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So here, after the flood, God promises Noah and his family, and was everybody who would come after them, what's going to happen as long as this world continues? The cycle of kind of how yeah. things work. The natural cycle of how things work in between day and night and the different seasons. So that natural cycle is going to continue, God promises, so that we can be provided for. Genesis 9, verse 3. Lucas. Everything that lives and moves, everything that lives, everything that lives and moves in the belt will be food for you. And just as I who gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So what does God say that people can, can have for food so that they can survive? Everything. The, the, plant. the 
plants and the animals, huh? Anything that lives. Anything, anything really that lives. That's going to then provide that, that nourishment that our bodies need. Deuteronomy 8. Verses 17 to 19. Elena. You may say to yourself, My power and strength in my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to see His blood, and so confirm, confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors, as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods and worship, and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely. What does God remind his people of? Remind us of there. All the things that we have, that we need for our body and life, whether it be our food or clothes or shelter or anything else, where does it come from? God. It comes from God ultimately, doesn't it? No. It may be that we went out and worked very hard in order to earn that or to produce the crop or whatever it might be, but who gave us the ability even to be able to do that? It's God. So ultimately, all of that comes from God, and without God blessing it, our efforts, uh, without God ultimately giving that to us, uh, we wouldn't have that. So all those things come from, from the Lord. Generally, He gives them through those natural means, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe put that down for the first one. Uh, God usually provides for us by natural means. So if I want to have something to eat, well, i got to go out and get a job so that I can you know, go to the store and buy some food or I have to you know, go out and grow it myself or go out and hunt it myself. Um, I shouldn't just sit down at my table at night necessarily and expect, well, I'm going to be, God promises to take care of me, so there's going to be food there. Huh? Um, generally, he works through natural means. John 6. Starting at verse 6, Tyler. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small, barely low and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves to give thanks, distributed, the loaf, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough, he said to his he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Nothing let nothing be waste. So they gathered the them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves and left over barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. So here Jesus feeds this crowd well, 5,000 men, plus there would have been women and children in, in the group too, so maybe it was 10,000, maybe 15,000 people. What did he use to feed them all? Yeah, so think of that. how far do you think, suppose, suppose if you had five dinner rolls and a couple little sunfish, how many people would that feed? Me. <laughs> And that probably was good, huh? This was probably this one boy's lunch that he had brought along. It probably wasn't intended for any more than than, than him. Um, but Jesus feeds this whole crowd from that. You know, he 
he starts, he takes the bread, he breaks a couple pieces off, and he gives it to the disciples to distribute, and he's still got the same amount left, and he just keeps doing that. And in fact, when everybody gets done eating, and, it, and nobody went hungry, did they? Well, they all ate as much as they wanted. How much is left? More than there was to start with. More than there was to start with. Well, the 12 baskets probably, you know, again, yeah, they were probably small lunch type baskets was was the case so that each disciple in a sense had another lunch so you probably had 12 times as much as what they started with you know instead of one lunch they had 12 lunches left um, wasn't necessarily a special meal in any way oh this was just a common i suppose kind of sack lunch that somebody might have carried with them but it certainly was very welcome it fed them uh, took care of their needs how did God provide in this case? By miracle. By a miracle, huh? This was certainly something out of the natural way of, of things happening, but God there provided by Jesus provided by means of a, of a miracle. Matthew nineteen verse twenty six. Emma. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So how can God provide and work for, for us? Is he limited by anything? No. 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 Uh, he's almighty, remember. Huh? So he can do whatever. Should we expect that he's going to perform a miracle to provide for our needs? No. no. We certainly have many instances of that in the Bible, both Old and New Testament of God doing that. But he tells us generally he's going to work through those natural means. Um, remember when the people of Israel were traveling through the, through the wilderness on their way from Egypt to the promised land and they didn't have any water? And when God, say, God told Moses to tap the rock and water came up out of it huh? so that they could yeah, in one case Moses in anger you know, hit it. the other would be a picture of Elijah remember the beginning of Elijah's ministry God told him to go live by this brook and the ravens brought him food huh? uh, ravens are scavengers they usually come and steal your food in this case they brought uh, Elijah food. Later on then he would go and be fed miraculously by a widow whose flour and oil never ran out as long as the uh, as the famine occurred. So imagine that, going to your, your bucket with your flour every morning, I'm going to make some, some bread or some pancakes, you take a cup of flour out of there and mix it up and the next day you come back and you take another one out and every day there's still the same amount in there. Uh, God miraculously provided for, for Elijah and for that widow and, and, and her son. So God certainly can provide by means of miracle, can he? Uh, you know, and, and maybe sometimes um, today uh, things happen and, and maybe we don't have a complete explanation for it. I think of maybe somebody who is uh, sometimes maybe diagnosed with like a cancer and the doctors say, well, there's you know, not much we can do and that, that cancer, at least for a time, goes into remission, huh? And the doctors can say, we don't know, it's a medical miracle, huh? You know, so certainly the Lord can still do those sort of things, and, and maybe at times still does, but generally he works through those natural means. So second line, though, we can, God can provide for us by miracles. Well, does God provide for what we need? In a sense, it's perfectly, isn't it? Because he gives us exactly what he knows we need and what is best for us. Um, but let's look and see just what the case is. Psalm 37, verse 5.
And what does the Lord promise? Is he going to take care of us? Yes. Can we count on him? Yes. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. Lucas? And God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will you will abound in every good work, as it is written. Oh, that's part. What does it say about how God provides there? Abundantly. Abundantly. What does it mean if you have an abundance? A lot. You have a lot more than you really need, and certainly we can look and say. For our physical needs, God gives us more than just what we need, doesn't He? He gives us a lot of what we want too, uh, and even our, our needs. You know, think of that. I, I need food, don't I? But I don't necessarily need anything fancy, do I? Oh, and yet, a lot of times we have special stuff, don't we? Um, you know, um, when I think. Well, I need clothes, but do I need a change of clothes every day? No. Not necessarily, do I? No. Um, you know, I need some shelter, especially probably these next few days. Huh? <laughs> but do I need, you know, a nice home with a whole bunch of different rooms and all that sort of stuff? I don't need that, huh? Um, but yet, again, how richly God blesses us, doesn't he? Uh, abundantly. And notice, too, part of the reason why God does that. So that we can do what? So that now we don't have to worry, but we're freed to do what? At the end of that verse, what does he say? What's that, Tyler? Oh, Elena? Abound in every good work. So that then we can glorify God by what we do and that we can even serve those around us huh if I don't have to worry about where my next meal is going to come from and I'm freed from from that that great concern then I can be free to focus on serving God and, and serving those that, that God has given me in my life uh, that, that I can can serve so again God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Similar passage in, in Philippians. So, anyway, God provides for my bodily needs richly and daily. picture of the, the water coming out of the rock and I think in fact and Moses got upset with the people but remember remember why was Moses upset with the people what did they do again and again worshiping, worshiping idols but what also did they do as far as how when God provided for them they complained an awful lot didn't they we've got to eat this manna every day well we don't have any water you know they probably didn't have too many changes of clothes, huh? They're traveling through the, the desert having to carry all of that. And in fact, for those 40 years, God made provided so that their clothing and shoes didn't wear out. So it wasn't like they were going, you know, every morning to this closet full of, of clothes and deciding, well, I wonder what I should wear. Um, you know, and so they complained an awful lot. Um, we can maybe understand that. You know, Jesus teaches us what? We read the passage, give us this day our daily bread. Think of what our reaction probably would be if that's if that's all that God did, huh? Gave us our daily bread. You think we'd complain? Yeah. Probably, huh? Um, yeah, God certainly provides for us very richly, doesn't he? What else does God do 
to preserve us. Psalm 32, verse 7. tell us there that God does for us. He protects us. us. So he not only provides for what we need, but he protects us from from danger and from, from troubles. Psalm 91. Tyler, verses 9 and 10. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and Make the most high your dwelling. No harm will overtake you. No disasters will come near your tent. So again, what does Psalm writer tell us God's going to do? Protection. He's going to protect us. He's going to watch over us. Psalm 50, verse 15. to do there when he does allow troubles to come he will get us through it so God's promise to protect us does that mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen in our life no No. Uh, we're going to see one thing God does when he allows that trouble is it makes us go to him for help huh that's a blessing that God gives. So sometimes sometimes God keeps trouble completely away from us. Huh? Uh, sometimes he allows it. So that, for one, that we are, are led to rely on him. Another thing he does when he allows that trouble, Romans 8, verse 28. Ethan. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So what does that tell us that God does even with those evils and bad things that happen in our life? He works some way for our good. Now, do we always see that? No. No. Um, Maybe sometimes there are things that happen and maybe somewhere in the future we can look back and we can see, you know, at the time that was a, I struggled going through that. That was a difficult situation for me. But I can look and see Look how God worked that so that this happened, which ultimately led to to this really greater good happening in my life. Uh, Yeah, sometimes God allows us to see that. Most of the time, that's not the case. Um, Many of those things probably won't be until we get to heaven that we'll finally see how God was able to to use all of that for our good so that we, we ended up there in heaven with him. But we have that assurance that God is going to work uh, ultimately for our good. Uh, Genesis 5 verse 20. Here's a good example of God working an evil for good. Lucas? Here's Joseph. What happened to Joseph? Remember? What's that? His brothers sold him into slavery, huh? Because they were jealous of him, and and Joseph ends up ultimately in prison. But ultimately, he ends up second in command in Egypt, and is able to store up grain for during the good years, so that that there's food when these seven years of famine come. Did Joseph's brothers intend any good when they sold him into slavery? No. No, they did it out of, out of hatred, huh? 
They didn't have any good thoughts toward him at the time. But God certainly worked that for good, huh? Good for Joseph, good for even for those brothers who had acted that way, that they were saved, and ultimately good for all people because, remember, that was the line of the Savior. Um, so there's a case where God allowed Joseph and his brothers to see how this bad, and especially put yourself in Joseph's case, that's a lot of bad things that happened to him. Um, but Joseph was able to see how that, that worked for, for good, not only for him, but for many other, other people. Hebrews 12, verse 10. So God uses those things for what purpose? When he allows troubles and problems in our lives. For our to strengthen our faith. It's discipline, huh? Um, What's discipline? Um, discipline. What's that? It's painful sometimes. It's painful sometimes. It's what? Teaching someone a lesson. Teaching someone a lesson, huh? I mean, there may be punishment. There may be some hard things involved. But ultimately, the goal is good, isn't it? Um, and maybe, let's look at that word there. Discipline. What other word do you see in there? Disciple. So the purpose is to make a disciple, make a follower. Now, your parents discipline you at times. Do they do that because they don't like you? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> That's what you think sometimes, huh? But ultimately, since your parents love you, they're doing that because they want to teach you what's right and keep you from doing what's wrong so that you grow up to be a, you know, a responsible adult, huh? So that you don't end up in, in greater problems maybe at some point. Do your parents always discipline you properly? Probably not. Probably not. Huh? They're sinners. Sometimes maybe the discipline is too hard. Sometimes maybe the discipline isn't hard enough. Um, you know, so they make mistakes in that way. What about God when he disciplines us? No. He, does it he does it perfectly, doesn't he? And he knows exactly what is going to be best for us. And so even when those troubles come, we can be sure that God's at, at work ultimately for our good. Um, think of how God took care of Daniel in the lion's den. He protected him, didn't he? Or how God protected his people when he brought them out of Egypt. Uh, there, by, in those cases, by means of miracle, uh, allowing them to cross the, the Red Sea on dry ground and uh, drowning Pharaoh's army in, in, in the sea. God protects and watches over us, too. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, and, and it happened, we're, we're maybe almost got in a car accident, huh? You know, there's a near miss, and you go, the Lord was watching over us, huh? But how many times do you suppose maybe God keeps that so far away that we don't ever recognize there was even a problem or a potential problem? Probably happens a lot more than we would think, huh? We don't recognize that. Uh, or we think of, oh well, yeah, God provides for us, but how many things, how many things could go wrong that don't go wrong, huh? Um, that God is, again, watching over protecting us and, and taking care of us. Um, so, God protects us from evil by either keeping it away, by rescuing us from it, or by working it for our, our good. Probably should have given you at least another line there. Huh?
What special way does God protect us? Hebrews 1 verse 14. What does that point us to? Who does that point us to? That God uses to protect us and watch over us and serve us? Angels. Angels. Uh, angels are messengers. Huh? God's messengers. And they serve God and he uses them to serve us. Psalm 103, verse 20. points us to the angels. And what do the angels do, does it say? His bidding. They do his bidding. They do what God wants. And so as God takes care of us, he sends his angels as, as his servants to, to do that at times. Psalm 91 verse 11. Lucas? For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all you are wearing. Again, those angels are there to watch over and, and protect us. Um, and sometimes you think of the idea of somebody having a guardian angel. Not exactly what the Bible teaches. Um, better, maybe, you know, there may be a lot of angels there that are watching over us at times. Um, at times in the Bible, we see. You know, those angels making themselves known in a little bit way where the believers are able to see them actually at work. Uh, God allows that. Uh, most of the time, kind of again, behind the scenes, aren't they? Uh, we don't see them. But I think of what a comfort that is, you know, that God has his angels watching over us as, as well. Um, so... An angel coming, announcing to it's supposed to be Joseph there, the birth of, of Jesus. Um, you know, the angels again serve as his messengers. Um, probably an angel looks like maybe sitting on, on a stone there. You think of the angels announcing Jesus' resurrection. Uh, we have the angels with the apostles when they're in prison, uh, letting Peter, for instance, out of jail. Where now those angels were were seen in some way. Um, we have different pictures of the angels at times. Sometimes they take on different forms. They're again spirit beings, but uh, God can allow them to take on different forms to again serve Him as they serve us. So God sends His angels to guard us, and just a, a further comfort that God gives us when it comes to His care for us. Why does God preserve us? Why does my Heavenly Father take care of me? Psalm 118, verse 1. thank him? Why does he care for us? Because of his love. Romans 9 verse 16. Tyler? It does not 
therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. God's mercy. What's mercy? Um, like undeserved love. No, that's not great. Undeserved love is more the idea of grace. Mercy, mercy is like the love that you have for somebody who is in need. Like sympathy. It's a compassion, sympathy for. Could we survive on our own? No. If God said, okay, I'm not going to provide for you, take care of yourself, how long would we last? A day. Um, not that long. Not very long, huh? Um, so God looks at us, and what does he see? He sees weak, miserable sinners who you know, are, are in desperate need and in mercy. God not only provides a Savior, but he cares for all of our physical needs as well huh? and preserves our, our physical life and gives to us spiritual and, and, and eternal life. Um, I suppose if you want to think of, of mercy, um, say here in the next couple of days you'd be driving down the road, it's snowing, the wind's blowing, and you see this person, they're standing out in the yard, their house is burning up, they have nothing left, and they don't even have a coat on, they had to get out of their house so fast, they're in their slippers, um, shivering. If you had mercy on them, what would you do? Probably help them. The You'd stop and help them in whatever way you could, huh? You know, so the compassion and mercy are very similar type of ideas, very similar words. God has compassion on us, God has mercy on us, and he provides for us. Romans 8, verse 32. Emma. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So it tells us, first of all, what did God do for us? What has he already done for us? What has he given us? Up his son. Gave his son for us, so that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. How big a thing is that? That's a pretty big thing. Huh? That's that's a huge uh, show of his love, a huge sacrifice that he made. In comparison, how big a deal is it for him to provide for food that we need or give us shelter? Same amount. Pretty small, isn't it? Huh? That's really kind of a small thing, isn't it? I mean, that doesn't take much for God to provide food. I mean, we see Jesus provides for 15,000 people with just uh, taking one boy's lunch and dividing it up, huh? So certainly for God to, to provide for us the physical things, that's kind of kind of little. So if God did this great, big, huge thing for us in giving to us Jesus to be his Savior, how likely do you think it is that God's going to keep his promise to take care of us in all the other ways that he's promised? We can count on that, can't we? Huh? You know, in fact, in some ways, if, if you went and you spent a thousands of dollars on, on something special. You, know, you used up all your savings to, to get whatever it was. How would you care for that? Really? Would you come home and toss it in the corner and kind of forget about it? No. Would you no. say, oh, well, you know, really I, you know, <laughs> fell out of your hands and dropped on the on the sidewalk outside, and, well, I don't want to bend over and pick it up right now and my back's a little stiff I just leave it there I'll, um, maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll see if I can pick it up. You wouldn't do that I'd would you? And be gone by tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if, if, if you if this was something special that you had paid a high price for you'd take care of it wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Well God paid a very high price for us didn't he? Uh, the death of, of Jesus on the cross. Well certainly he's also going to take care of us isn't he? Well, that's really the promise that we have there in that, in that verse. Genesis 32, verse 10. Unworthy of all kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant. 
I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. This is Jacob as he's coming back to the promised land. Remember he had stolen the birthright from his brother Esau and he had had to flee because Esau wanted him dead and he went and lived for a number of years with his his uncle Laban in, in Haran. And so when he left, as he says, all he had was the clothes on his back and the staff in his hand. You know, that first night as he laid down under the stars, he had to use a rock for a pillow. Um, and now when he comes back all these years later, he's got, you know, he's married and he's got children. And he's got all these flocks and herds, so much so that he's got them divided into to two different groups so that if Esau's still mad and wanting to come and kill him, he won't get everybody. You know, one group can get away. Um, God had blessed him, hadn't he? Did he deserve any of that? No. No. Do we deserve anything that God gives us? No. No. Uh, we're, we're sinners. We disobey him. Uh, even though God blesses us, we continue to uh, sin and break his commands, and yet God, in his love, continues to provide for us. So, why does God do that? It's his love and mercy, not because I've earned it, not because I deserve it. How am I going to respond then? What's God's providing for me going to lead me to do? Take a look to thank him. Let's look at the passages. Psalm 106, verse 1. So the psalm writer encourages us to give thanks to God. Huh? Um, how do we give thanks to Him? Certainly we give thanks by saying thanks huh, in our prayers and that. But how also do we thank Him? Going to church. Going to church. First Samuel 12, verse 24. So in response to the great things God has done, what does he encourage us to do? Fear him. Fear him, which is a, res a holy respect and awe, and serve, serve him. Huh? Obey his commands. Huh? You know, that's certainly something that shows our, our thanks. Huh? I think that maybe your, your parents do something special for you, give you some, some, some gift or something, uh, or help you out in some way. And now they come and they ask you, well, can you come dry these dishes? Or can you come do this little task? You know, I'm not going to do that. How much thanks are you showing them for what they've done for you? Negative. <laughs> Negative. <laughs> Negative, yeah. Um, much more even when it comes to God, isn't it? Huh? Mm -hmm. Think of all that God has done and given to us. Um, well, now we serve him by by obeying him and following his commands. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Tyler. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God? To walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
Again, he wants us to obey him, to have a respect and love for him as well. And I suppose the additional thing in that passage, where's that obedience to come from? All your soul and heart. All your heart and soul, huh? So it isn't just a matter that, well, God said, and God gave me these things, so I suppose I should do this, huh? I suppose I got this, so now I got to do this, huh? But it's a willing, joyful service, isn't it? Um, you know, so, is it, well, not because I have to, but because I want to, because I since get to, huh? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So how much of our life, then, is one of thanksgiving to God? All of it. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Emma? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Again, all of our life. If I am doing what the Lord has placed before me, following His commands and His will, ultimately I'm giving him thanks. I don't have to necessarily go out of my way looking for things to to do. Huh? Uh, by being, I suppose, a obedient child, a faithful student, uh, whatever the task is that the God has given me to do, if I do that faithfully, uh, out, of, out of love for the Lord, that's a thanksgiving. Uh, so, thank and praise and serve and obey him. And certainly there are times when we can do special things related to the Lord in His church that are going to show thanks. Um, and a lot of times our, our thanksgiving is simply a matter of living our Christian faith every day of our life. John doesn't like work, so he quit his job. Now he's run out of food. Complaints that God isn't taking care of him. Do you agree or disagree with John's evaluation of the situation? Why? I disagree. Because God like gave him the job, so he yeah, like, has food and everything, and then he's just like, I don't like it. I don't want it. Yeah. So God gave him the ability, didn't He? God gave him even the opportunity. He just stopped and obeyed. Um, he just didn't want it. But he didn't want to. He kind of rejected those blessings. Um, you know, he didn't like his job. Maybe he maybe he could have gone job. looking for a different job. Before maybe he shouldn't have quit the job he had until he had found another one. Um, but certainly it wasn't that God wasn't caring for him, was it? What do you think of this? Anne can't afford a new dress that she wants very much. She complains that God isn't preserving her like he had promised. She she don't need, need, a need a new dress. Yeah. God gives us all that we need, doesn't he? Uh, he gives us what he knows is best for us. Um, doesn't mean that we're always going to have everything that we want, though, it does it. Um, that if we always had everything we want and got everything we wanted, how much would we need God? We wouldn't, we wouldn't would we? Um, you know, we'd start to think that we deserve that, we earned that, that we have a right to that. We certainly wouldn't be very thankful for anything that we had. Um, and you know, ultimately, we'd fall away in unbelief. Joan was in an accident and injured. She says, I can't see how this can be for good in my life. What would you say to her? What's your reminder of? We don't always see it. We don't always see it. What do we know, though? How can we be sure that God is going to even care for us and, and work that ultimately for our eternal good. I she didn't die. <laughs> well, what happened if she even died? Then she'd be in heaven, wouldn't she? So where's the, the greatest evidence that God is going to work things for our, our good? Where would you look to see that great good? In the Bible. And who in the Bible? Uh, Jesus. 
Jesus, huh? Again, suppose even look. Does Jesus being crucified look like anything good? No. It's like probably the worst thing that ever happened in the world, huh? The only person who truly was innocent dies this terrible death, huh? I mean, we say nothing worse has ever happened, and yet has anything better ever happened? No. Not since the fall into sin, huh? Because that was for our forgiveness and salvation. And again, if God did that, certainly he's going to take care of these other promises, isn't he? Joe falls and breaks his leg. Jim has never had a broken bone. Agree or disagree? God is protecting Jim better than he protects Joe. Jim is protecting Joe's only broken leg, not Jim. He's doing, he, Jim Jim hasn't, so God's watching him over him better. Everyone's life is like different, and like God like does things like differently for each person. God deals with us as individuals, doesn't he? Doesn't he, he knows like what each one of us needs in every circumstance. Um, so he knows what's best for Joe, and he knows what's best for Jim. And it's not always the same. And sometimes you know, God gives one person a great deal of physical blessings and keeps, seems like, harm from them. And they live, you know, like say, well, they really have a blessed life. And another person, you know, Christian, devoted to the Lord, may seem to have one problem after another. Huh? It doesn't mean that God loves one more than the other or that he's not taking care of one or doing a better job with one or the other. But he knows what each individual needs, and he's going to, to do what truly is best for us. So we kind of talked about this one too. Huh? The greatest degree, the reason God provides richly for one person or nation, not another, is because there's one is more pleasing to him. Not necessarily the case. Is it? Now, there may be a connection there. Huh? You know, the, the person who, you know, in, in unbelief, you know, wastes all that he has, he may end up not having much, huh? Um, whereas God often does give physical blessing as well to those who uh, love and serve Him. Um, and suppose even to look through the history of the world, a lot of the times nations have prospered when they've been under a Christian influence. Um, not always, but that's very often been the case. So. Again, God does what he knows is best for each one of his His believers, doesn't he? And sometimes that may not be uh, that we need great physical blessing. Sometimes it, it may be that, that suffering and trouble is what's best for us to discipline us. 